So this amazing speaker who's going to be leading this session is a really a world pioneer and a leader in learning and memory, and particularly, I would say, in the interplay of cognitive neuroscience and learning and memory. Um, she's really well known around the world, and she will actually tell you about her science. So I'm not going to bore you with that. But when I think about this leader in memory, actually two memories of my own come to mind. One is sitting in an East Asian restaurant in Chicago, our speaker was at, the, at Northwestern University at the time, um, listening to our speaker and her partner, her husband, um, opine eruditely on cognitive neuroscience, and tears were streaming down my cheeks. It had nothing to do with their talk, it was just the food was so absolutely hot. So I really <laughs> couldn't stand it. And I was trying to hide it, because I was actually enjoying the talk and enjoying the food, but whatever. This memory is imprinted in my brain. The other one more recent is actually smack in the middle of COVID, where we kind of decided we're going to do something and go to New York and try to find a time. By that time, our speaker was a, a director of a research center in New York. And we decided to try to find a place that completely was free of COVID, not a single viral particle. And we found the Palm Court, which is this airy restaurant that looks just like this, with palms or whatever in the old Plaza Hotel. Um, the kid who lives there, uh, and you know who that person is, did not show up, but the memories are amazing. So you probably want me to stop talking about my memories and actually instead listen to a speaker. So it is an absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Yelena Radulovich. Yelena, take it away. Uh, thank you, Tally. I came back home covered with blotches from head to toe after that plaza dinner because I learned I had lobster allergy. So that <laughs> was an interesting development. Uh, I've been many years at Northwestern University uh, uh, where I really uh, uh, loved uh, my colleagues and my environment, but then, as you know, you become restless in your middle age. So in the middle of COVID 2020 on Thanksgiving, I moved to Einstein in New York. That was also an interesting memory. The findings I'll be talking to you about today are data generated in both labs. I will not talk about our most recent data, but I decided to make a selection of the data I found most exciting or most surprising or most something throughout my career, uh, which started in neuroscience in 1998. So uh, I've been working on stress because, as you know, uh, Earlier, as well as today, stress has been recognized as one of the uh, strongest uh, uh, causative factors lead to stress-related disorders, such as PTSD, but it also plays a very important role in the exacerbation and the symptomatology development in almost every psychiatric illness. And uh, our overarching hypothesis is that the affective symptoms of psychiatric disorders are rooted in the way that stressful experiences are represented in memory circuits, and that by studying memories and cognitive processes in general, we actually uh, uh, have the best chance to understand more affective states. Uh, I only partly agree here with William James, who said that some events are so emotional as to leave a scar upon the cerebral tissue. And that is because I don't think that events are emotional at all. It is what we make out of events and the way how we evaluate and interpret the world that at the end uh, uh, will uh, result uh, in specific uh, types of memory representations and associated behavior and affect. So in my talk today, I will have two parts. Uh, from one slide to 25, I'll be talking about the neurobiological mechanisms underlying the formations of negative memories, uh, which I consider to be adaptive and uh, just physiological uh, and necessary for survival. The second type, uh, part of my talk, I will be talking about the modulation of these memories by stress with the selected models that I found particularly interesting. Uh, I would like to highlight here, I don't know whether Lynn is here, but uh, actually Lynn Nadal, who is attending the conference in 1998, published a paper saying traumatic memory is special. And all I can say is that every bit of uh, data that we have generated so far completely confirms that. At the time when Lynn wrote this paper, there was a big debate in the field of cognitive 
uh, uh, science saying that there's nothing special about traumatic memories and that they're just like any other memory if you look at them phenomenologically. So things have obviously changed and uh, I will tell you more about how we see that at the neurobiological level. Uh, this is, slide is probably known to all. Uh, uh, as you know, memory systems uh, uh, are uh, many. Uh, they differ in uh, phenomenology, they differ uh, in large part in uh, neuroanatomical basis, uh, and they all are essential for some vital functions for our survival. Uh, however, we also know that we mostly identify with episodic memories, which are memories of our own personal, intimate, subjective experiences of past events, places where they happened, times when they happened, their relationship, and so on. And uh, my lab has been working on uh, uh, rodent or mouse models, trying to get close uh, to the episodic memories in humans. Uh, over the years, uh, yes, so what is it that I think uh, are the three minimal essential components of every memory representation. One is the coding of the features of external stimuli and their relationships. The second is the internal state of the subject during memory formation. And the third is the value of both. Uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, we know a lot about these things, but far from sufficient. And fortunately, there is a lot of work to be done. And I will highlight, uh, uh, in a way, how we in my lab think about the, the processing of all these different components. The key, the, uh, what do we achieve with encoding these different things? Well, if we encode the features of external events, uh, uh, this part of the representation helps us recognize these events in the future. The value is critical for organizing our emotional, affective relationship and uh, uh, our behavior in response to, uh, uh, rec to uh, recognizing the stimuli. And lastly, internal states play a critical role in the uh, retrieval of memories and all the processes associated with retrieval, such as extinction, stabilization, generalization, and so on. So, uh, just to make it simple, if you look at the behavioral graphs, they will all have the same y-axis from now to the end. Uh, on the, every behavior will be freezing behavior, as percentage of recorded samples during a three-minute exposure to a box where animals were either previously conditioned or not. So every single behavioral graph will be freezing, and I think that will make things easier to follow from now on. Uh, then the paradigm itself is really very simple. I think this is probably the simplest learning paradigm that we know of. Uh, we put mice in a box and deliver a shock after three minutes. Occasionally, we can put a tone and so on, but I think I decided to present mostly the context data today. And then 24 hours later, or at different times after conditioning, we measure freezing. Uh, so there are four features of the memory which we particularly uh, uh, find important to study, and we have studied the mechanisms of the features uh, uh, in depth. One is specificity which is how well the animals can differentiate two boxes. And our paradigm is devised so that animals can actually really differentiate very easily. So the boxes are sufficiently different that we can always see freezing in the conditioning box and not in the new box where the animals didn't get the shock. The second is associativity. So we know that this freezing behavior that we see when we test is not just due to the fact that exp animals experience shock. The shock has to be delivered at a certain time so that it flows into the uh, uh, processing of the context representation. If we give it in the beginning, these mice will just walk around that box as if they received no shock whatsoever. Uh, the third is uh, these memories can extinguish. Uh, memories for context extinguish a bit slower than for cues. In our lab, it takes about six to eight days typically for them to extinguish. Uh, however, they do. And what happens during extinction is that animals remain with two memories that in a weird way coexist. We don't know exactly how, but we know that at retrieval, uh, the animals are in a way deciding whether they will behave based on the first information, namely shock, or based on the extinction information, namely no shock. 
Uh, and the last and really important part of studying context conditioning is the persistence of the memory. We can look at the retention of this memory up to two months. I know that some people have looked even further than that and you still see high freezing behavior. So, another paradigm that I'll briefly mention, but it is important, is that we can actually devise a way to differentiate the formation of memories of the context, which is a configural representation of the space, order, tactile information, and everything that comprises that static new environment. And we can differentiate that context, coding of that context information from its association with the shock. And we can do that if we just space the context exposure and the immediate shock presentation for tw by 24 hours. So this is a, a phenomenon discovered by Mike Fenslow and uh, used by Jerry Rudy and O'Reilly for all kinds of uh, computational models showing uh, how we can detangle studying uh, uh, the formation of the context memory from the attachment of a negative value, if you want, or the association of shock, if you want, and I don't think we know yet which of the two it is. So, going back to the slide that I show, what is it that we actually study when we do context conditioning? Well, we can study uh, uh, the mechanisms that uh, contribute to the formation of a specific memory. We can study the mechanisms uh, uh, that drive the negative veil of the memory, and we can also study state-dependent retrieval. All of this is possible to model in rodents, which gives us the unique opportunity to go deeper in the mechanism of learning. Now, uh, I don't know whether this is a consensus. I'm pretty sure many people share this view, but our view is that memories are actually patterns of activity generated by discrete neuronal assemblies that subserve the reconstruction of our experiences of the world and ourselves. Uh, this may sound not very uh, uh, dramatic, however, I have to say I'm still in a complete ignorance about which activity patterns these are. And as we go along, uh, and as you have probably heard a lot, we can study activity patterns at many different levels. We can look at spikes, we can look at population activity, we can look at the different signaling molecules, immediate early genes, and so on and so forth, and we will end up with quite different information. So I still have some uncertainty about the patterns themselves, but we know that they have to be somehow generated to reconstruct the past experience. Now, how do we generate these patterns? There are many different mechanisms by which brains can do that. First of all, we already have different patterns uh, uh, as we start our lives. So, during processes of heritability and development, we end up with neurons where not a single neuron is alike another one. This is huge work initiated by Gerald Chan. I think that there is a big consortium of at least 18 big labs throughout the states now investigating this uh, genetic diversity between individual neurons. What this means for us, that the nervous system probably ends up functioning like the immune system, that we have cells which are, in theory, through some random process or not, uh, able to tune to any stimulus in the environment so that when we're exposed to a stimulus, we already have a lot of preformed material that will respond to that stimulus. And everything we do afterwards is now further differentiation and further processing in the network. The second mechanism is generation of patterns through signaling ending with epigenetic changes, which gives most stability to cellular states. A third is stabilization of memory circuits uh, uh, through forming stable uh, uh, interneuronal control of uh, excitatory networks through perineuronal nets. Fourth, LTP, the most famous way of organizing uh, specificity among neuronal assemblies through, through enhancing connectivity or decreasing connectivity in case of LTD. And uh, then we can organize activity around oscillations, which also generate specific ways of recalling and encoding information. And lastly, uh, there are ways of coordinating the activity across brain areas which help promote and preferentially access this over that information. Today I will talk, I believe, about four of these potential mechanisms. Uh, briefly, not in depth. 
So uh, given the role of the hippocampus in the formation of context memory, memories and given that uh, uh, context memories are only transiently hippocampally dependent and then with the time, uh, over time, become more cortically dependent, uh, I will be talking uh, first about the mechanisms in the hippocampus that control the formation of memory. And then I will talk about what you can see in the furthest end, probably from that part, from your perspective, which is interactions between the dorsal hippocampus and the retrosplenial cortex uh, that has been subject of our work uh, in the past several years. So if I were to choose an approach that would completely erase a memory so that the animals are brought in the box again and again and again without showing any clues that they've ever been there, I would choose to block NR2A uh, uh, receptors of the NMDA receptor complex. In our hands, that has worked better than any other manipulation, and we have tried a lot over 30 years. Uh, at the time when we did these experiments, actually, this was uh, a bit counterintuitive because NR2B was promoted as the memory molecule given uh, uh, data from initial transgenic mouse lines. However, as you can see here, uh, uh, first on the schematic, in 2004, there were data showing that as animals mature and there is a shift in the gene expression for NR2A and NR2B, LTP becomes much more NR2A dependent, and LTD becomes NR2B dependent. And our data in many ways confirm that, uh, in the sense that if we block NMD receptors both, that's uh, APV in the first behavioral graph, somewhere in the middle, and then or MVP, which is an NR2A selective antagonist, uh, we can completely prevent the formation of a memory. And in the last bar is the NR2B antagonist, which was entirely ineffective. We then got hold of the NR2A knockout some years later, and we found that these knockouts were completely impaired. And another interesting thing along stress and memory and affect is that these animals actually do not develop any of the depression phenotypes that we normally, normally see uh, after stress and other manipulations. So, uh, we then also showed through a serious experiment that uh, 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 everything which has to do with NR2A function is also affecting uh, the formation of memories. In this example on the uh, left-hand side uh, is our manipulations of the IQ gap scaffold protein, which controls not only the uh, uh, coupling of NR2A to signaling pathways, but also regulates their surface expression. If we knock down IQ gap one, we neither have signaling nor see surface uh, NR2A nor see a context memory. And uh, another, uh, uh, the last uh, a bit of information I would like to add here because it will turn out to be relevant for stress is that if we in cell culture activate hippocampal neurons, either with NR2A, which are synaptic, or NR2B, which are extrasynaptic, or both, what we see is that only NR2A generated signals end up in the nucleus. Uh, both NR2A and NR2B activate uh, dendritic signaling pathways. In this case, it was ERK, but we've done that also with CAM kinase and CREB. Uh, however, all the NR2A signals propagate to the nucleus. If we co-activate them, we see a signaling block. And this is important because often when we see uh, uh, abnormal signaling in neurons, we are prone to believe that there is not enough glutamate. However, we can equally have the same effect if we have too much glutamate, which will activate both receptor populations. And lastly, I want to turn your attention in case you've missed this paper because I really like this data. I will not take any credit for that except for the behavior because it was all done in the lab uh, of Murali Prakriya, who uh, was my collaborator from Northwestern. So another part of the NR uh, NMDA receptor signaling system, which is really important for memory formation, but also other things that many of you may be interested at the cellular level, is that NR NMDA receptors actually generated tiny calcium currents. We are all used to believe that there is massive calcium entry after activi activation of NR NMDA receptors. And what Murali and his colleagues show, if you see on the now right-hand side, the bottom first graph in blue, 
You see that if you uncage glutamate in specific dendritic spines, you see nice blue spikes showing calcium release. But then, if you knock out the receptors that release calcium from intracellular storage, this uh, uh, current remains very tiny, it's very small, which means that the calcium that enters through NMDA receptors is really very small, and that most of it is then amplified through uh, uh, release from intracellular stores. Obviously, these animals are also uh, uh, impaired in uh, forming a context memory. So because NMDA receptors are synaptic receptors, obviously this could uh, uh, be a mechanism by which we can generate specificity in memory representations at the synaptic levels. The thing is that synaptic events are also circuit events, whether they are uh, related to local circuits or long-range connectivity. So uh, with the time, we started to look more at the connectivity of the hippocampus and at the destiny of the memory beyond uh, uh, that hippocampal processing phase. And uh, uh, we all knew that the dorsal hippocampus is really massively connected to the entorhinal cortex, but then we found that there was one other projection, and actually the only other projection of the dorsal hippocampus to cortical areas, which is uh, uh, ending in the layer 203 of the retrosplenial cortex. So retrosplenial is just above the dorsal hippocampus. It's a prominent part of the posterior cortex. And in a way, that shouldn't be surprising that part, uh, that, that neuroanatomical area is known already uh, uh, from human studies, that it plays an important role in memory. But what was interesting for us about the retrosplenial, we always thought, as it's the case with many other memory systems, at least when you study context memories, is that they are temporarily dependent on the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, and then with the time they become dependent on the prefrontal cortex. Well, with the retrosplenial, this is different. The retrosplenial is important from the first day on to the end. So we could completely abolish memory retrieval if we block uh, uh, activation of the retrosplenial even the second day after memory formation. The interesting thing is now, why do you need both and to what extent they complement one another? There has been work in there. There are some ideas that the or originally the retrosplenial memory is not sufficiently mature, suffi sufficiently specific. So we have some evidence for that. Uh, but it is certainly a target of our research uh, based on its importance. We found that there are at least three different types of pathways by which the hippocampus conveys information to the retrosplenial cortex. Two are excitatory, uh, which contain either VGLUT1 or VGLUT2, and one is inhibitory. The excitatory one stems from the subiculum, and the, the inhibitory one from the lacunosum molecular layer of the CA1. When we look at the, interestingly, at the contribution of these projections to memory, especially the excitatory ones, you can see that if we block, M -glo uh, if we block uh, 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 the uh, uh, vesicular glutamate transporter one containing uh, uh, terminals, we completely block the formation of memories. So we don't see any memory early on or later on. With VGLUT2, we don't see any effects early on. However, these memories persist for a shorter time. So here we see how the different pathways uh, uh, contribute to different components of the memory. Another thing I wanted to highlight that got us a bit closer to the processing of memory valence, although I think we will learn much more down the road during this uh, 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 conference, uh, because I'm still not really sure how to conceptualize value, so hopefully we'll discuss this more. Uh, but we wanted to see uh, how context memories become negative. So what is it that makes them distressing? And because we never saw any hints for that in the hippocampal cortical circuit, we decided to look at hippocampal uh, afferents from subcortical areas. We started with the most prominent ones from the medial septum, from the supramammillary body, and saw nothing. But then when we did the supramammillary injections, we drifted a little bit with some of the injections and saw that some VTA cells were labeled. And we ended up looking at the VTA afferents to the hippocampus, and we found several important things. One, that these pathways are required for context memory formation, but actually 
not really for the context memory formation, but for the association with the shock. And how did we know that? Well, we used the paradigm that I described in the beginning. We uncoupled the context presentation from the shock presentation, and we saw only effect if we had the shock on board. These animals could form normally a context memory. Uh, we then wanted to test in a different model uh, what if we have different memories? If we are correct, this would mean that if we stimulate these terminals, we can also bias animal's response from a neutral to a negative memory. And to do that, we did the experiment, which is there at the bottom, but you don't have to look at the detail, many bars. I'll just explain it. So we conditioned animals, they all acquired fear, they were all freezing, and then we extinguished the fear until they went significantly down. What we did afterwards was to re-expose them to a very brief shock reminder and induce reinstatement. We, di we did reinstatement either in animals treated with vehicle or in animals where the VTA afferents were inhibited uh, using chemogenetic inhibition. And again, what we saw that in males, reinstatement was significantly attenuated and in the females, it was completely abolished. Uh, and lastly, it turned out that these terminals were both necessary and sufficient for reinstatement because without any shock reminder, we could see reinstatement of fear only if we optogenetically stimulate these terminals. Uh, we believe we found some interesting differences between males and females. I'm showing this not because the differences were so big, but this is the first one that we've seen. So we really have had problems seeing strong sex differences in contextual fear conditioning. Uh, although we uh, uh, diligently use both males and females, and here we did see. And you can see that the branching, uh, there, there are more terminals uh, uh, in the females. But something that could be even more interesting, especially to the electrophysiological audience here, is that there were really differences in the, how these afferents were stimulating uh, uh, dented granular neurons. So the spikes that we saw in males had much slower decay than in females. And we first thought is that because males are maybe NMDA, females are uh, AMPA, both turned out to be AMPA currents. Uh, so, uh, and it seems also that these differences persist through stimulation of different pathways and different inputs as well. So, uh, yeah, just in case. Okay, so we've talked about now uh, the synaptic organization circuit. So what are, these are really, I'm talking the strongest requirements. I don't think that's all to the story. There are many other data. I'm really, just to repeat, doing a selection here of what I thought in our hands were the strongest effects. So what happens after this activation of the neurons? The next thing is, of course, to propagate the signal and go through the whole signaling pathway, protein synthesis, gene expression, and hopefully ending up somewhere where uh, uh, the memory will be represented. And first, when we did analysis uh, uh, and looked at the different signaling pathways, you know, in the old times, this is old, this is 13 years ago, uh, if we look at the signaling, if we just put the animals in the context, we see some pathways active. In response to the shock, which is the second, the red circle, hardly anything gets activated. And then if we have context and shock, we have really very strong activation, and these are all different papers and different references. This is really not just from our lab. That was a very consistent finding. And then in the second graph, there is a comparison of signaling pathways between condition and extinction, and it turns out that many of these pathways are deactivated during extinction. So that led us to believe that there are, is signaling related to the formation of negative memory versus signaling related to the formation uh, of a neutral memory. And uh, we then looked at uh, uh, whether we can identify differences in the cell population. So whether this is due to the change of signaling in the conditioning population or whether this is uh, uh, now emergence of a new population of cells that code the memory. And our data suggested that it's different populations, and this is what we published, and that's what we claimed in the title of our paper, Segregated Populations, and I'm not sure that I believe that anymore. And I'll tell you why. 
If I look through the Earth, just some representative signaling pathways and looking at signaling and at individual cells, I can't find any reasonable pattern indicating anything. Uh, first of all, we know that all these molecules which are highlighted here, EGR1, CFOS, NF-kappa-B, CREB, uh, birth dating of neurons, you know, whenever there is a new study, we look at our data and compare it to see whether we'll find some relationship to our data. And it all looks random. For example, we see FOS in uh, high EGR-containing cells, but also in no EGR-containing cells. We see FOS in high CREB-containing neurons and no CREB-containing neurons or low CREB-containing neurons. We see FOS together upregulated with NF-kappa-B and also in cells which do not have nf kappa so, what, which of these neurons? They're all activated neurons. So why do you believe that some of them represent the memory and others not, and why? And that's an, uh, something that I really would like to answer one day, but at the moment, all I can say that this, uh, uh, oh yeah, and best of all is if we do tagging and reactivation studies, all we see that a tiny fraction of these neurons is reactivated, if you look at it. And we focus on those rather than looking at the 90% of the others which are not reactivated uh, uh, in a way. So uh, these are some thoughts I've had about this, I thought I would share. So first of all, it may be that these signaling pathways are simply first pass responders to a stimulus and that maybe the representation doesn't end up in these cells. The second possibility we're thinking about is that maybe all of these different populations contribute to memory assembly, but confer different properties to the assembly. Maybe some are more stable, maybe some are more reactivatable, or something like that. And the third is that maybe only a subset of each of these, which has some critical combination of signaling molecules, is the one that will be recruited and ultimately uh, uh, become a part of the memory. So, but I do believe that looking at one uh, only of these things, how they activate and reactivate, I just don't think that uh, uh, this is enough. And I will show some data. I mean, we use these approaches, uh, but I'll show you some of the data uh, uh, that I will discuss for along the way. Now, finally, I got to the non-synaptic mechanisms, which is uh, a new line of research in our lab. And uh, this is because, uh, based on the systems consolidation theory, right, the idea is that uh, memories become, with the time, more cortically dependent. However, the hippocampus, you know, is expected to provide, keep providing information to the cortex uh, during that memory maturation. So the hippocampus is believed to have an instructive role in that cortical maturation of memory. And for that to happen, we thought, well, maybe there is still some activity in the hippocampus also beyond these two or three days where we normally look for immediate or delayed, or, uh, delayed gene expression. And uh, uh, because Cyril Harry, I mean, they had this uh, uh, breakthrough pa uh, paper in science uh, using the uh, tone fear conditioning in the amygdala, showing a key role of perineuronal nets uh, in, especially in the persistence of memory, uh, we decided to check whether they play a similar role in the hippocampus. For those who are main, may not be familiar uh, uh, with this, uh, so as you know, most patterns in the brain are generated through inhibition. Uh, so it's inhibitory neurons which in a way decides which neurons will be activated, and only those who escape inhibitory control are the ones which will end up being activated. But interneuronal activity is transient, it comes and goes, so that can't alone account for the persistence of memory assemblies. And I believe that the best model we have at the moment, I'm sure there'll be others, but uh, uh, what has been discovered is that PV, parvalbumin positive interneurons, uh, become engulfed in these structures, which you see there in red on the image, uh, which are is thick connective tissue, there's a proteoglycans, uh, that, uh, uh, and the idea is that they uh, 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 control synaptic input to inhibitory neurons and stabilize the controls of memory, uh, of neuronal assemblies, uh, and protect them from interference by intervening uh, information. So, and what we did was use uh, 
uh, chondroitinase, an enzyme that degrades perineuronal nets just to see first whether they are important, and indeed they are. And indeed, they did nothing to recent memory, but they uh, completely uh, attenuated and uh, uh, impaired the retrieval of remote memories. Uh, this, in a way, was strange for us, I have to say, in the beginning, because perineuronal nets are formed really early. And we were surprised that we see their effect so much later. So it's possible that synaptic mechanisms are enough to maintain activity in the hippocampus for a while, but then uh, 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 the perineuronal nets are gaining more control over the assemblies. Another unexpected finding, which if you, even if you're interested to read the paper, you probably won't pay attention because it's supplementary figure 56, is that NR2A uh, circled uh, uh, panel. Uh, it is generally believed that perineuronal nets are formed by synaptic inputs. And these are NR2A knockouts. And we talk that NR2A, the key synaptic inputs to memory circuits. And these animals have completely normal perineuronal nets. So we thought that most likely uh, uh, different mechanisms are involved in the formation of perineuronal nets. And we did some gene expression studies and so on and so forth. What came up was really interesting because if you study across the genes, although here I have to say we didn't look at all, we did a selection of cytoskeletally regulated genes because more than 80% were cytoskeletally regulated genes. So if you look at them and you look at the furthest right hand side graphs and you see the light bars relative to the green bars, all the light green bars are uh, genes which are involved in the generation and function of the primary cilium. So suddenly we ended up from the synapse to the primary cilium, which has nothing to do with the synapse. It is located close to the nucleus of a neuron, but it communicates and it uh, is highly sensitive to changes of the extracellular environment, but it also changes the extracellular environment. So it inter interacts with the extracellular matrix and all these molecules which are critically involved in the formation of perineuronal nets. Indeed, when we block the formation of the cilium, the perineuronal nets uh, are completely dissipated. And here we really could see selective CA1 disappearance. We had local manipulations, the dentate where we didn't perform injections were preserved. Okay, I think that this is the last, if you still hold, this is the last piece of information I would like to share before moving to stress. This has to do with uh, actually state-dependent coding of memories. We had a talk this morning about that, so I'm very pleased with it because this means I don't have to talk very much about this. But I did want to mention something in case some of you study these things and maybe uh, uh, find it useful. When we look at the activity in these brain areas that I was talking about, the hippocampus, retrospinal cortex, and so on, we have measured uh, uh, in many different occasions uh, their activity during, uh, their, their local field potentials during learning and retrieval. And uh, I have to say that the most robust finding that we saw was that the peak coherence between hippocampus, thalamus, retrospinal cortex, anterior single cortex, and only in the theta frequency, always happens during learning. If we disrupt this with any manipulation, we see uh, memory deficits. And there are different kinds of deficits, and in some cases we can't even access the memory or find the proof that the memory is there. But in the graph that you see below, we found something more interesting. Namely, we disrupted the coherent activity between the hippocampus and cortical areas by increasing tonic inhibition using a drug. So gaboxyl is a drug which acts on tonic GABA receptors. It increases tonic inhibition. It increases delta waves, which is unusual. That's a semi-hypnotic state for the animals. What happens when we train the animals under the drug is that these animals can only remember the context memory uh, when we put them back on drug. If they're off drug, they don't remember anything. So we have seen some effects with other compounds and other manipulations, but this is the strongest we've ever seen, and it looked as if there is a complete amnestic barrier between the physiological condition and the 
uh, uh, gaboxyl induced condition. What is interesting about these memories is they uh, are persistently hippocampally dependent, so we can retrieve them by recreating this state in the hippocampus. And not only that they not, don't even seem to reach the cortex, but the cortex even suppresses this memory. So it has a completely opposite effect than on memories acquired under physiological conditions. Okay, this is the summary. So all of that until now can be summarized uh, that to form a context memory, we need NMDA receptors uh, and uh, amplification and nuclear propagation of their signals, so especially NR2A subunit. We need interactions between the hippocampus and the retrospinal cortex, and input from the VTA excitatory, by the way, excitatory input, this is not dopaminergic, I didn't mention that, this is purely glutamatergic, everything in the undersynaptic is excitatory. After this synaptic phase, what we see is a shift from actin-dependent synaptic uh, uh, signaling to non-synaptic mechanisms which seem to control the persistence of memories. And then we also found state-dependent mechanisms which control the interactions of this circuit which actually determine retrieval and accessibility of these memories to retrieval. And I will skip concluding anything on the cellular mechanisms for now. That, that may be for the next talk someday. <laughs> now, Getting to the stress, so this will become easier because I will just repeat some of the mechanisms we already talked about, only using stress as an intervening or as an additional modulator. Uh, the famous curve by Yerkes and Dotson, uh, which shows that memories are uh, first enhanced by stress and then impaired by stress, proved too simplistic uh, uh, in our work. And I will share with you what I thought was really noteworthy. So today we have developed different models by which stress uh, modulates memory circuits, but today I will briefly mention the first two, and then I will talk a little bit more about stress-induced generalization, which is our latest uh, uh, data. On the, this, I couldn't resist showing. The first slide on the top, left uh, is from 99. That was my first stress experiment ever when the world was still black and white. And uh, what you can see there is that if we inject CRF in the hippocampus of the mice, their freezing behavior doubles relative to fear conditioning if you don't inject CRF. What is also interesting here, if you see here, we also use the toe. And therefore, we had to test the animals in a new context. And if you look at the new context, which is the invisible bar in the middle between the white and the black, this tells you that these animals didn't generalize at all. So it was not that all the fear was amplified and all, uh, 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 that really looked as a potentiation of a very specific context memory. Uh, what is also interesting to highlight here is that we could replicate this by stress. But interestingly, when we block the CRF receptor, we only block this net enhancement. We never really impaired memory with uh, uh, antagonism of these receptors. Many years later, uh, my postdoc Natalie Tronson, now all grown up, did a series of experiments uh, which completely replicated these findings, but then identify a role of a different a transmitter system, namely of metabotropic glutamate receptors. And what she found was that in response to stress, there is an intracellular change, namely uh, a change in the scaffolding of metabotropic glutamate receptors, which leads them to decouple from the scaffolds and become constitutively active. And I, now that I look at this graph, I wonder why we never study whether the two are somehow related, but uh, yeah, salvi. So, we, what is also interesting about these effects are that the only thing that was affected was the intensity of fear. Specificity, persistence, extinction, everything functions uh, uh, was uh, remained unaffected. Then there is the second one which I wanted to briefly show you, is what happens if we now stress the animals with more shocks, but then in one group we present the shocks in an unpredictable manner. If we do that, we don't affect the intensity of fear at all, but these animals do not extinguish. 
They keep freezing. Here we have only uh, up to five days. I remember at the time uh, uh, my postdoc, Kevin Corcoran, did an experiment up to a month, and these animals were still freezing. Not only they were freezing, but they also didn't uh, uh, activate at all the ERK signaling pathway, which, if you remember, it was long ago, we showed that they are really critical for extinction of fear. And this was the time, and if you remember, at the time we first thought, boy, maybe they don't activate the glutamate receptors properly. Then we saw that they are actually hyperactivated. And we can get them out of that extinction-resistant state if we block NMDA receptors. And when we saw that effect for the first time, we realized why this cycloserine didn't work for extinction in humans. Uh, if our findings have any relationship to human patients, uh, this would mean that activating glutamate receptors would actually really not have any benefit. If anything, it would be the contrary. And, okay, I can skip this. I'm, I don't know how I'm doing with time, though. Ten? Okay. No, I can mess. I can, uh, yeah, I don't have much more. So, I will mention this one because this was also a bit unusual. Uh, and it has to do with the state-dependent memories. So if we expose the mice in that state, in the different states to exaggerated stress, what we see is spillover. So we don't see effect on, only on the context memories, but we also get the social circuits involved. And suddenly these animals start uh, 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 becoming much less sociable. So, uh, uh, and that was the only stress paradigm that we used that affected actually, I mean, uh, 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 social behavior, which was not social stress. So social stress does that, but non-social stress usually uh, uh, in our hands doesn't affect very much. Lastly, I will just uh, uh, briefly mention uh, generalization, which is another re really important phenotype, both for PTSD and for depression, but in a very different way. And that's why I would like to clarify immediately uh, what we de define as generalization. It's applying rules learned in one situation to similar situations. Uh, why am I highlighting that? We can see at the behavioral level generalization as a discrimination deficit. If animals simply cannot differentiate one thing from another, it will give us the impression that they generalize, but that's a deficit. It is not a cognitive faculty. So we really wanted to look at what makes the animals apply the, the, the fear rules, let's say, acquired in one situation to others. And to avoid the problem, whether it's one or the other, we actually decided to first train the animals and see that they can differentiate. So we know that the boxes are sufficiently different that when they train them, they freeze in the orange box and not in the pink box. What happens then if we, after that memory retrieval test, either do social defeat in males or social instability stress in females? As you can see, in the, uh, uh, both in males and females, in the post-stress graphs, is that they freeze to both. So suddenly, uh, 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 this, the whole discrimination disappears and the animals freeze. This freezing was accompanied by uh, reduced uh, low gamma power in the hippocampus and by reduced amplitude of acetylcholine release and increased, that was due to increased acetylcholine levels. So obviously, it, the system was pushed to some uh, uh, ceiling and all the oscillations that we normally see during recall were abolished. Consistent with our thought that this could be cholinergic, we could completely reverse this if we uh, block uh, muscarinic uh, cholinergic receptors in the hippocampus. We could do the same if we block the afferents arriving from the medial septum to the hippocampus. And now comes, ah, again, the frustrating part of the cell populations. So we know that we can label different populations based on their signaling properties. And as we were doing these experiments, Ying Shilin uh, actually worked on uh, FOS, uh, labeling FOS-activating cells from NPAS-activating cells, which are here red and blue, uh, in the cartoon, and it reverse in the picture. And what they 
published in a very prominent cell paper is that the FRAM, the FOS-driven population, is responsible for generalization, and the NRAM is responsible for coding the specific context memory. And we thought this would be the ideal thing for us to look at, is the stress now causing generalization through by activating FOS or inhibiting NRAM? And none of that turned out to be true. So what turned out to be true is that the, the, and this is the only, I mean, I, I remember my student, Lynn, she counted five months of her life spent counting CA1, CA2, CA3, dentate, uh, proximal distal blades, everything you can imagine. We ended up with this one difference, but pretty significant relative to how this labeling and reactivation system operates. What we saw was no role whatsoever of the FRAM cells, which are supposed to be the generalization cells. However, we saw hyperactivation of NRAM cells. So the NPAS cells were uh, activated more in context B in stress than in non-stressed animals. But not only that, they also co-activated CFOS, which under normal conditions you never see together. So in the dente gyrus, these are typically separate populations. And uh, uh, what we believe, although we still don't have a direct proof, is why this hyperactivity happens, is at the same time we notice that the uh, red signals that you see there around the blue DAP stainings, this, uh, uh, the red signal is a core repressor, it's a, a, the rest repressor, which is completely excluded from the nucleus. And then we could reverse all these changes if we block the cholinergic input. So, and lastly, to support all this, we could block generalization if we inactivate the NRAM cells and not the FRAM cells. So to summarize this is we found that actually social stress, social defeat uh, uh, applied after memories are formed can uh, trigger potently generalization by recruiting the uh, septohippocampal cholinergic system, leading to inappropriate reactivation of some kind of memory co coding neurons uh, causing, and if we take for granted that these are the neurons that code the specific context shock memory, this would mean that suddenly cells uh, which code one thing are inappropriately activated in a very different situation. So, we know that for generalization we need similarity, but we didn't change the similarity of this box. All we change, so, so this would mean that this really is a very strange phenomenon, Unless we look back at the human data, and uh, which Marina Picciotto has stressed uh, repeatedly in her work, and our data completely support her model, is that the cholinergic system actually induces negative affective states. And probably this hypercholinergic activity and the internal state is at some level matching the shock experience before, leading to the reactivation based on internal state resemblance rather than of changes of the contextual resemblance. So similarity could operate also based on internal states, probably based on value, as well as based on everything else. So here I am. Yes, in conclusion, stress doesn't only impair or enhance memory, it can discreetly affect the intensity of a memory, specificity, persistence, and all these different features. All these mechanisms seem to be different from one another, so we can really delineate them, although I'm sure that they overlap at some level. And uh, most of them are not really involved in the normal processing of a fear memory, uh, so they seem to be stress-specific. And I believe this could be a framework for analysis of stress-induced phenotypes in humans, uh, which may have different vulnerability for one or other phenotypes. And uh, up there is my lab uh, at Northwestern, where uh, most of this work has been done before I moved to uh, Einstein in 2020 on Thanksgiving Day in the middle of COVID. So this is a good memory, kind of not. <laughs> and here we are in Central Park, and now we continue working there. Thank you, and sorry if I overstepped my time.